is the art of the entrepreneur born, or is this something that you can be modeled through your family upbringing? You know, I, I, I believe that it can be learned. Uh, I mean, there are certain things you can't teach people. You can't teach uh, ethics. If you, if you haven't learned ethics by the time you're seven years old, that's going, to be, that's going to be tough. So I think the first thing, you know, when you're starting something new and it's a small number of people and you're gradually building it up, the glue that holds it all together is trust. So one of the key things about leadership is that you have to have, I would say, ethics and integrity. I mean, people have to, you've got to do what you say you're going to do and do it when you say it's going to be done and uh, and people have to know that, you know, I mean, it could be that somebody throws a hand grenade over into your cabbage patch and you've promised people a whole bunch of cabbages. All you can do is pick up the phone and say, guess what, you know, somebody threw a hand grenade in and all the cabbages are gone. But, you know, that's not the way things normally are. I mean, accidents and unfortunate things occur, which you cannot plan for. You, you can expect them, but you don't plan your life around wheels falling off all the time. That's what lawyers do. The wheels will, well, the law degree teaches you the wheels are going to fall off. It's only a matter of time. And by the way, you can't be too careful. That's not a fantastic ingredient for innovation and entrepreneurship. That doesn't mean lawyers can't be innovators and entrepreneurs, uh, but it's with great difficulty. Uh, so I think the best training for, um, for being uh, an entrepreneur and an innovator is an engineering training. Uh, because engineers are taught that design matters, uh, that... Um, that you've, you've got systems and systems have often have complex parts and you're taught, taught that, the, that there are going to be trade-offs and that nothing's perfect and, and there's an iterative procedure that you, that it's just normal, that, you know, you're no, never going to get it right the first time and you don't have to be perfect but you've got to get something that's workable and robust um, and uh, that applies right through all engineering education whether it's chemical, electrical, mechanical, civil, and, and so on. So I think that's the, the, the best background. And, and, and in fact, I'm, I'm sort of plagiarising that a little bit because Michael Hammer, who unfortunately recently died, was a professor of computer science and electrical engineering at MIT. He's the guy that did the re-engineering um, books. And um, he was a professor at MIT. And uh, he, he said in a, in a Fortune magazine article that I read years ago, it was kind of, you know, he just put in words what I'd, what I'd or, always thought. Uh, but I, I think that is, it doesn't mean other people can't be, uh, you know, innovators or entrepreneurs. Um, but uh, I think it helps with that sort of background. How influential was your experience at MIT? I, you know, I think it's very hard to be objective about yourself. I think, in fact, one can say it's impossible. I mean, I... But how influential was MIT? Um, well, see, I was a student there. And uh, it was sort of like being hit by a fire hose. I mean, I was sort of reasonably bright, you know, honours degree, whatever, at Sydney University. But when I went there, you had the top kids from Princeton and Cambridge and England and Eccole Polytechnique. And, um, and I wasn't as smart as I thought I was anymore, if you like. Um, but, you know, having... A, and I, my plan was to do a master's degree and get out of Dodge. Um, and I... I uh, and MIT is an unusual place because they had this, um, in, in chemical engineering, they had this thing called chemical engineering practice, which was started years ago. And you did academic work, whether it's thermodynamics and heat and mass transfer and, and so on and so forth. Um, and then you worked under the tutelage of a professor. It could be a Dow Chemical, a DuPont, um, Standard Oil of California, whatever. You, you work somewhere to solve a major problem and the faculty member went with you. Now, I knew lots of guys that did that and ironically I didn't do that because I'd been working for three years and I didn't think I needed it. Maybe in retrospect I should have done it. But So I did a, a thesis on membranes for the artificial kidney. But the people I was working with who were on the practice program, most of the, the faculty actually were doing consulting and the consulting People are saying, gee, you know, the, the normal thought is, gee, these guys are out consulting. They should be back here teaching. But they, get, but they get paid for nine months a year at MIT, and the other three months you can use an office, but then you don't get paid a nickel. So you've actually, you're forced to go out and get other income. And so these guys naturally gravitated to industry. And they said, well, you know, what programs, what things are you working on that, that you feel are important that you need solving? And so they'd bring them back onto the campus, get students to work on it, and, and this way you're getting exposed to the real, the real world. 
So I, I got exposed in that sort of way because the, the faculty I was interacting with were actually chairman of, of companies outside MIT. Uh, they were working at high levels uh, as consultants at the very highest levels, you know, places like Exxon or Exo and, and DuPont and so forth. Um, and to me, that was just, it was kind of natural, a natural thing to do. So I ended up working some more in San Francisco, Standard Oil, California. I got recruited back to MIT in the office of the president, working as an industrial liaison officer. And I got even more exposure at a high level because, you know, there are all these MIT guys, a lot of whom, like the president of DuPont was an MIT guy, for example. Um, I can't remember his name, or maybe I can, Chuck Holliday, I think it was. But anyway, but I, the contacts I had were at these very high levels and and it was very useful. And these guys would come in, we'd have lunch and dinners with MIT faculty members, some of whom were Nobel laureates, like Paul Samuelson, uh, as you know, the economist. And I, I, I used to feel a bit embarrassed calling Paul and say, Paul, you know, it's another lunch and uh, you've got some bozos in. And they weren't bozos, but... You know, he probably had better things to do, but they were, they were generally pretty good about meeting with us and so on. Then I decided, oh, Al, this isn't working for me, and I thought I wanted to be an academic, and I did become an academic, and I did a PhD in biomedical engineering. Turned out it was in the University of Washington, even though I was at MIT. I had a scholarship offer at MIT, one, an offer at the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Washington, but I went to Washington because that's where... The tank, Henry Tankoff, the Tankoff catheter developer, was there. I was interested in dialysis. The Scribner, uh, Scrib building Scribner, the Scribner shunt developer was there, and they also offered me twice as much money. So that that was also <laughs> kind of helpful. But that, that was good, and I, I finished my PhD there. They offered me they offered me a job on the faculty, and then I got recruited back from there to the University of New South Wales. Peter, do you think the environment for the entrepreneur today? had changed markedly from where it was perhaps when you first started out? Well, you know, I think that um, everywhere in the world, if, if you look, it doesn't matter whether you're in Germany or Sweden or whatever, nearly all um, high-level institutions are talking about the need for innovation and entrepreneurship. They're trying to set up clusters. I mean, Cambridge is doing it. Even Oxford is reluctantly being dragged into, into that area. Um, so I think the universities, the campuses are, are, are understanding you need to do this. Uh, at the same time, they're, they're, there's a lot more uh, accountability, there's a lot more regulation, there's a lot more, you know, if you like, impediments being put in place. So, it, you know, it's a, it's, even though people want it, they, they sort of somehow want it, but then they, they, they put roadblocks in, in the way. And it, it's, uh, some of that's a little bit unfortunate. Uh, you know, business liaison offices and, and, and of course the universities think they can automatically get rich and so forth. The US of course has had a history of this. I mean, you look at Stanford and MIT, I mean, it, it's just the number of companies, those, just those two campuses on the east and west coast of the United States, the number of companies they've spawned is mind-boggling. And people look at that uh, almost, I wouldn't say with envy, but gee, what can we learn from this and, and so on. I mean, you look at Google and Yahoo and, you know, basically out of and Hewlett Packard, the classic example, you know, Dave Packard and Bill Hewlett. Um, and ironically, Bill Hewlett was also an MIT guy as well as a Stanford guy. But um, th those guys, they've had a history, many, many decades of, of doing this. So can we learn from these guys? Absolutely, we must learn from them. Um, but I, I think it's something now that campuses realise they, they must do. So the environment now... Sure, you've got more impediments, the, the, the accountability and so forth, and I think we're going, the pendulum is swinging too much to, to, to that area, and, and there's a bit of greed and so forth on, on both the part of the universities, uh, and um, maybe a little bit of enviousness as, as well, but there's much more activity, and I'd say there's much, much more opportunity now for entrepreneurship and, and innovation because it's just it's just happening and people realize that if you're living in an environment such as ours which is a very you know very high cost of living and particularly now with the with the financial uh, challenges that, that are there we'll get through it just like all all challenges you, you get through it uh, it's not clear exactly how that's going to happen uh, but capitalism has a has a way of dealing with these issues and as long as you let the market and not regulators solve our problems because regulators create problems rather than solve it 
Do we need regulation? Yes, we do. But you've got to be very circumspect and careful because of the law of unexpected consequences. So yes, we need some regulation, but capitalism, the free market is the way to do it. And the free market requires innovation and entrepreneurship. Why? Because we are living with very high standard of living and if you don't innovate, you're dead. And I don't care whether you're General Electric or IBM or ResMed. If we don't innovate, and I say this all the time, if we, if we don't innovate, we are dead. We have to get new products and processes and new concepts out there high margin businesses which employ lots of people, hopefully employ lots of people, and they're at the leading edge of, of technology. We have to do that or, or we're just dead. So it has to be catalyzed.